Well, good morning and welcome to Village Green. We invite you to stand with us as we worship together this morning. You may be seated as Sue comes for strategic communication. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. If you're joining us online, welcome. Today is Communion Sunday, so if you're online, please make sure that you have prepared your elements for communion. Today we're going to be starting a new sermon series. It's called Hearing Jesus. Are you looking forward to that? Yeah, yeah great. Life groups are starting up this week as well, so if you're not already part of a life group and you would like to be part of one, you can reach out to the office 
and find out what groups are available that you can join. And you do that by emailing office at villagegreenchurch.com. There is a congregational budget meeting scheduled for directly following the service today. Please stay and be part of this important meeting. If you would like a copy of the draft budget, it is available on the Welcome Center desk in the foyer. Day camp registration is open. So those of you with kids, that's an exciting time for the summer. We have a Dulham camps and Forest Cliff camps this summer. And just to note that there are subsidies available from the church for both these camps. And we're able to subsidize the day camps, but not the overnight camps. Village Green is also going to be hosting a Dulham Camps Music Day Camp for anyone entering grade four to five in September of this year, 2024. Whether you have musical experience or not, this is your chance to grow your musical talent. You get to choose guitar, drums, trumpet, musical theater. Sounds fun, doesn't it? Don't you wish it was for anyone, any age? What you can expect is to come for a day full of games, chapel, crafts, and of course music. And there will be a final variety show showcasing the music classes that the kids have done together. And that will be presented on the last day of camp. Register soon to reserve your spot. Adullam's early bird pricing ends at the end of this month, April. So you want to get in your registration before that. Subsidies, again, are available through the church. Please visit adullam.ca for more information. Or you can contact Julianne. At, and you can do that by emailing youth at villagegreenchurch.com. Let's pray together. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to meet together and to worship you, to be reminded of who you are and to intentionally take time to fan the flames of our faith this morning. We thank you for all who are here today. God, we ask that you would meet with every one of us here today. We thank you, God, also for those who give generously to support the ministry of the church here at Village Green and around the world. We ask that you would use these offerings for your glory and to build your kingdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, please stand as you are able as we continue in worship. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high.
pray together. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that failure is not part of your vocabulary. We thank you that you 
meet us afresh every day in a way that is full of grace and mercy, power, authority, redemption, forgiveness, so many things that we enjoy every day when we claim faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And as we have gathered together this morning, we just thank you that we can worship on a beautiful Sunday morning like this and reflect on your perfect grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Wonderful to have you here this morning. It's time for the youth and the youth, the children and the youth to go to their respective classrooms this morning. So good to have the second exodus happening. If I hold up my hands for a long period of time, will you come and help me? You know, just, uh, <laughs> All right, we are beginning... Um, that's last week's sermon, by the way. Okay. <laughs> I could repeat it because the resurrection is a great story, right? Absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Anyway, uh, while they're sorting that out, um, I want to begin by saying that we're starting a new five-part series entitled Hearing Jesus. And I'm going to start with a really basic truth about humanity, very general truth. Few of us, if any of us, were born with the gift of listening well. True? Yeah, yeah. We've all experienced the lack of listening that people have. I'm going to make it worse because I'm going to give you some statistics, okay? Adam Grant, who is the professor at Wharton, he wrote this. Think about how rare good listening is. Do you know that it's common, sorry to doctors out there, it's common for doctors to interrupt a patient within 11 seconds when it generally takes somebody 29 seconds to tell the doctor what's wrong with them. Wow, okay. No offense, doc. Um, Managers who rated themselves, uh, in fact, employees would rate their managers as the worst listeners by their employees, even though the managers judge themselves 94% to be really good listeners. So they're off the mark by 94%. That's staggering. In one poll, in, this is only one poll, one-third of women said their pets listen to them better than their husbands. <laughs> I think that poll's wrong. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's actually higher, <laughs> to, be, to be honest. Like, if I, yeah. One-third, I think that's generous, personally, but yeah, yeah. I'm sorry? Do last week's sermon. Do last week's sermon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about resurrection. Let's get off this topic altogether, okay? Yeah, yeah. Do you know that the number one complaint, the number one complaint about government, do you know what it is? They don't listen. They don't listen. We all talk about economics and all kinds of stuff, but that is generally the number one complaint. We have a government that lectures but doesn't listen. Okay, that's the number one complaint. Okay, we, it's, so it's, it's, it's epidemic everywhere. Research shows that generally we only listen oh, with a 25% efficiency. This means that about three quarters of spoken communication is lost to the average person. That makes my job really fun, doesn't it? What? To think, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I was, I, thank you. I was waiting for somebody to do that. Thank you. I set them up. You knock them down. Okay? Right? But to think that... Okay, okay this is going to sound very personal, but you know, all the work that goes into a message and to think that three-quarters of it is lost... Thank you for knocking that one down, too. Yeah, set it up, knock it down. All right, okay, we're, we're in a roll here, okay? That's why we're recording it, okay? Do you know that 85% of everything you learn is derived by listening? And, you know, if you're distracted at all or forgetful or preoccupied, um, you know, which we are 75% of the time, even though 85% is, you know, um, derived from listening, what we learn, okay? Here's a quote from a book by an author named Kate Murphy um, that's entitled, You're Not Listening, What You're Missing and Why It Matters. This is what she writes. At work, we are taught to lead the conversation. On social media, we are taught to shape our personal narratives. At parties, we talk over one another. So do our politicians. We're not listening, and no one seems to be listening to us. Despite living in a world where technology allows constant digital communication and opportunities to connect, it seems no one is really listening or even knows how to, and it's making us lonelier, more isolated, and less tolerant than ever before. This last part, I think, is critical to, as a takeaway. In fact, isn't that the danger of cancel culture? Cancel culture basically says, I'm not listening to you anymore. I'm, I'm walking away. This dialogue is done. And if you don't have dialogue, you have no resolution to any problem. Okay? Most of us listen to react and respond. We don't listen to understand. And understanding is key to listening. Let's drill down even further. Take prayer, for instance. How many of us think prayer is a one-way ride? Okay? How many of us listen to God? How many of us are you know, busy asking God and telling God as opposed to hearing from God. That's, that's, a critical, that's a critical component, you know? That is so vital to our whole health as a community is to learn to listen to one another. In the movie Avatar, okay, what's the key takeaway in the movie Avatar? I see you. It probably would have been better to have, I hear you, would have communicated far, far more. So why, why am I bringing any of this up this morning? Okay? We all know, if you're a believer, a believer for any amount of time, if you're online or in person with us this morning, we always talk about Jesus being a master communicator. He wasn't just a master communicator, he was a master listener. And in fact, the way that he shaped dialogue with other people was vitally important. He did certain things for a particular reason. Now, I'm going to take us through in the next five weeks, as a five-week series, a majority of the passages in the Gospel of John. Now, this is really under, really interesting because in the Gospel of John, there are no parables in the sense of the synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have parables, but in the Gospel of John, there isn't. In fact, there's this other literary device in the Gospel of John. The academics call it the misunderstanding motif. The misunderstanding motif. If you ever see M.M., in any commentaries when it comes to the Gospel of John, this is what they're talking about, where Jesus would say something, and it would sound absurd at first. And Jesus would use this 
in a very powerful way to the people he is talking to. We're going to show you examples of how this misunderstanding motive was used by Jesus. And this is, here's the first point I want to make, because this, this is kind of like the takeaway going into this, that Jesus would sometimes communicate in a way that tested who was really listening and what they were understanding. So he would communicate in this way, and he would test people on who was really listening and what they were understanding. Okay? So one of these misunderstandings we're going to look at this morning, and it's probably one of the really dramatic ones, because I'm sure if you had heard Jesus say this, you would have said, what are you talking about? The claim you're making is so outlandish and so unbelievable, and yet Jesus intentionally said it to see how far they were willing to understand what Jesus was saying and who he was. Because, because oftentimes the misunderstandings were pointing back to him. What are, you, what are you hearing about me, and what are you willing to accept about what my claims are? Okay? And there are just some people that would shut off right away. In fact, the majority of people in the Gospel of John would hear Jesus and they would go, no, not buying it. I'm walking away. This isn't what I want to take away from this. Okay? But there was others that were going to see that caught it right away. Who do you think had the greatest trouble accepting who Jesus said he was? The religious people. What we're finding in the Gospel of John is the people that had no strict religious upbringing or were disenfranchised by the religious people were the ones that heard Jesus the best. Okay? So, let's look at this um, particular passage this morning. Jesus has just turned water into wine. And now he's back in Jerusalem... And this is the kind of second kind of miracle sign thing that's going to transpire through this. So now we're back in Jerusalem, and let's pick it up there in John 2, verse 13. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins all over the floor, and turned over their tables. This is meek and mild Jesus. Okay? Then, going over to the people who sold doves. Why why doves? He told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Okay? Let's, let's park there. Why is it important that we're told it's the Passover? What is the significance of John telling us it's nearing the Passover? They need to make a sacrifice. Okay, they need to make a sacrifice. And subsequent to that is the fact that Jerusalem is being now overrun with people coming from all parts of of the countryside to come and to sacrifice because this is really important. Now, here's the reality. Here's here's the difficult thing, okay? Um, In that day and age, people would have to travel from a a, a, a long stretch. They couldn't very well bring a cow all the way to the journey, or bring whatever animal they needed to sacrifice. So it was not uncommon for people to be selling animals, especially animals that were appropriate for sacrifice in the temple. It was far easier to have the animals ready and for people to arrive and pay for the animals, etc., etc., and to do that. Not only that, but there's a temple tax, and the temple tax had to be paid, and People from all different areas would have to pay this temple tax, so there were money changers there that would exchange the money. All right? So what is Jesus mad at? They're set up in the, in, uh, 
Okay, you want to come up here, Sylvia, and finish this off? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, because that's right. What? Two stars. Okay? Okay? They're set up in the, in the court of the Gentiles, which, number one, is not good. And setting up in the court of the Gentiles, because there's different sections of the temple, and setting up in the court of the Gentiles doesn't allow the Gentiles to worship, because they cannot go any farther. Cannot go any farther. Okay, so here is one of the things that Jesus is upset about, and they should be outside of this temple area and selling that, maybe you know, next door or something like that. So it limited them, but another reason kind of exists, which is implied through the whole text, okay? And this is, and this is the point that you know, we're going to expand on in, in, in a minute. But the temple and its sacrificial system have become a means of financial exploitation. The religious system and the sacrificial system, the whole temple thing, have become a means of exploiting people financially. The church has never done that, right? Ouch. Ouch. And we're having our budget meeting right after this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're, <laughs> that's from the chair of our finance committee that just said, thanks, John. Notice he didn't say amen. He just said, thanks, John. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but they're exploiting people. And one of the keys to that is, is Jesus is talking to the people who are selling the doves. Why, you know, the doves are for the people who are poor and cannot afford cattle or sheep or any of those other things. Um, that is why Jesus is pointing them out, especially. You're exploiting the poor. And, and isn't it striking that you cannot come in and worship so you have the right sacrifice based on your social status. And you can't come in and worship unless you've paid the temple tax. And until you've done those things, then we'll let you in and then it's okay for you to worship. That would be like us telling you you can't come in here to worship unless you have a, like a Costco membership where we charge you for... Or your tithe ready. You know, you know what I mean? That's a little, you know, it's a little bit. It's a little bit what we're talking about here. Do we financially exploit people for the sake of religion? And this is, this is at the heart of what Jesus is really upset about. That they've turned it into a marketplace, not a place of worship. Not a place of worship. Let's continue reading. The disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. That comes out of Psalm 69, 9, that particular statement. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. Here's the statement. Here's the, here's the statement. What would you have heard if you heard Jesus say this? All right, Jesus replied. Destroy this temple. I think we're one frame too far. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Okay? Jewish, it's interesting to me, the Jewish leaders want proof, not reflecting on anything that Jesus has said to be remotely true in the sense that they're exploiting the temple for financial gain, okay? All right, let's, let's do the reaction then of the Pharisees because that's a pretty outlandish statement right out of the get-go, isn't it? What they exclaim, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. Notice that John has to put that little kind of commentary in there to explain what's happening, okay? After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, 
And they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. So this is, the mo- this is one of the more extreme misunderstandings in the gospel. And it's pretty dramatic. Okay? Now, this temple has taken 46 years. But do you know at the time it wasn't even finished? There was another 30 years yet that they were continuing to do work. The scaffolding was still up on the temple. Okay? But standing for a long time, centuries, but Herod, we've all heard of Herod, was the one that was now doing all this work, and he'd been doing it for decades. And the work still had another 30 years to be done. It was a project that lasted for quite some time. And what from I've read, it's, take, it's taken 10,000 workers to get it to where it is today at this point. They did such a good job, Herod did such a good job that it was even more magnificent, obviously, than Solomon's original temple had been. It ranked among the world's wonders of the day. And even when it was attacked and destroyed, because in 70 AD, the temple was totally destroyed. Even the commander of the, of the Roman forces actually tried to spare the temple because of how beautiful it was. Josephus, one of the most famous historians of that day, wrote that the temple project was one of Herod's most glorious of all of his actions, and it was sufficient as an everlasting memorial uh, to Herod. He was a lavish builder and had, you know, tons of cities and projects. In fact, do you know many of you, when Mary and Joseph were going to Bethlehem, on the path that would, would have led them to Bethlehem, do you, many of you know that there's, there's, there was a, a, a palace a, that Herod had built just along that same walkway, as that same path. So it was very likely that as Mary and Joseph were going to Bethlehem, that they would have passed one of Herod's uh, lavish palaces that was his personal home for quite a while. So this was, you know, one of his great accomplishments because Herod was this incredible builder. But Jesus is talking about his body. So here are, here are three quick takeaways about this. Jesus is saying that the religious leaders were destroying the temple by their abuses. To desecrate the worship area of God is going to expose you to the disfavor of God and ultimately the wrath of God. This is what Jesus, part of what Jesus is talking about. If you disrespect the temple, God is not going to be happy with you. And certainly, you know, some, you know, 40 plus years later, the temple is absolutely destroyed after so many years. Okay? The Romans did that in AD 70. Secondly, Jesus is the new temple. This is something we don't get in our modern Christianity. Okay? But Jesus is the new temple. Part of what the Gospel of John is teaching, especially since most scholars believe it was written after the temple was destroyed, is that Jesus is the new temple anyway. Okay? We don't need a temple anymore because Jesus is now the connecting point between us and God. The sacrificial system is done with. Authentic worship is no longer attached to Jerusalem or any other place. It is attached to Jesus. There's no pilgrimage to go anywhere, Jerusalem. There will only be the movement of the heart towards Christ. Jesus asks us to turn away from religion or, you know, religious ritual for the sake of ritual, okay? And secondly, that he's saying that the resurrection is the ultimate authentication of who he says he is. Jesus says, you want proof? Wait until you kill me, and then I will raise myself up in three days. That's the difference. So Jesus is no ordinary, ordinary man. Here's the third thing out of this. Jesus forces us to look beyond the material 
and the natural and to look to him for meaning and purpose. This is, you know, this is where, where Jesus runs into the religious pretension of the day and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the things that they had set up religiously. And they would sacrifice people for the sake of ritual and for the sake of temple and for the sake of ordinances and things like that. The people would be secondary to the primary issues of the law and of the feasts and of the rituals that they were experiencing. That Jesus is the way of connecting with God. And Jesus gave his life willingly for you so you could be in a relationship with God. Because Jesus is the way of connecting with God. For many of the religious leaders, they would go into the temple, make their sacrifices, and say, I'm connecting with God, and yet none of their lives would reflect a true worship, but they would say, I've been in the temple, I paid my dues, I did it all, I'm okay now. And that religious pretension was something that Jesus would repeat time and time again in Scripture. But are we really listening? Do we really hear what Jesus is saying? Or do we f deflect God and say, you know what? I don't like what I'm hearing. Okay? We are going to, on that note, <laughs> we're going to transition to communion. I'm going to invite Paulette, who is going to lead communion this morning to come up and to invite those that are also helping with communion to come forward. Paulette's going to have some important things to say. I hope you listen. 25%. Ten percent. Good morning. Um, here at Village Green, we have believers communion. And so that means all those who have accepted Christ as their personal savior are very welcome to join us in communion. If you have not done that, take a few minutes, think about it, and ask Christ today to enter your life. Um, let's just take a few minutes to reflect upon God's goodness. We celebrated Good Friday last Friday. What a wonderful service it was. So let's just reflect on God's grace quick grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Let's just take a few minutes. Father, this morning we reflect upon the cross, the great sacrifice of your son to save us from our sins. There is never enough thankfulness that we can offer to you. But today we ask that you would accept our love, our thankfulness, for Jesus. Amen. Let's just take a few minutes to reflect. The Lord, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which you do for me in remembrance of me.
Take this wafer as a sign of the body of Christ who died for you on that wonderful, wonderful day. Take, eat. In the same way, there was a cup. It was the reminder of the blood of Jesus. This morning, let us remember the blood that was sacrificed for all of our sins. Drink. This morning, let us rejoice. Let us rejoice for our Redeemer lives. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Amen. Sorry. We, sorry, something very important. <laughs> But no, very close to Dale's heart. Uh, we have a, a benevolent fund that'll be, collection that'll be taken up now. Um, I just want to say that as an elder, I never realized prior to being an elder how much our benevolent fund blesses people in our community, not just in our church, but in our community. Thank you for being so generous to the Benevolent Fund. Where's the... Oh. Parts of this. <laughs> uh, uh, please uh, dispose of your used cups in the um, bins. Thank you. All right, and as the offering and cups are being collected, why don't you stand with us one more time as we close our service and worship?
your light because your glory is so beautiful your glory is so We just thank you that you are good and we pray that as we go throughout our week that we would hear you and that we would just see more of you in your name amen we look forward to seeing you next week don't forget we have a budget meeting after the service today and uh, for those of you online we hope you watch again next week have a great week <laughs>